tell you this, you know what you're going to learn in the all things? Is you're going to learn that He is the I am God. Because sometimes I've been way down here and I say, God, I don't know how you're going to reach me. Down here, God, where are you at? Down here, who are you? Where are you at? He goes, I am. I am here. I'm here before you got here. I'm here in your pain. What about over here when I'm doing good? I'm here too. I'm the I am God. Wherever you are, I'm already there. And I'm already made a way where there is no way. In fact, I am the way. I love, I love that song um, that we speak the name of Jesus. That's a good song. And uh, it's funny um, because it, uh, maybe the last quarter of 2019, I have a best friend. He's my best friend in the whole world. His name is Brian. And uh, it was maybe like November of 2019. Uh, and, and Brian got like really, really sick. Like had to go to the hospital. Was just like, I mean, ha having trouble breathing. Like, I mean, my man was like sick, sick. And uh, I remember... He, he was in the hospital. We were all praying for him, but nobody knew what the issue was. And then after a couple of weeks, he was fine. He came home. Everything was good. And then uh, uh, news broke out that there was this thing called COVID-19. Remember Tom Hanks got that? And then we all freaked out, remember? <laughs> no, you didn't live through that thing called COVID. <laughs> uh, and then articles started coming out around March, April, May of 2020 saying this, if you had these symptoms at the end of last year, it's a 90% chance that you had COVID and you just didn't know it because we didn't have a name for it yet. And I said to my friend Brian, I said, bruh, you had it. You had the vid, bro. You had the COVID. And I said, were you scared? Were you nervous? He's like, no, I wasn't scared. I was like, were you nervous? He's like, no, I wasn't nervous. I was like, were, were you like freaking out? He said, no, I wasn't freaking out. I was like, you know why? Because the enemy has to give something a name in order for it to elicit fear. And in the same way that the enemy has to name something so that you can be afraid of it, in the same way that there's a name that brings fear, a name that brings nervousness, a name that brings panic, oh, we believe today that there's a name that brings hope. There's a name that brings life. There's a name that brings healing. There's a name that brings faith. There's a name that brings peace. There's a name that brings joy. And his name is Jesus. He's the name above every. He's the name above every, he's the name above every name. Here we go. Here's the good news today. If it's got a name, Jesus is above it. If it has a name, then that means Jesus is enthroned above it. Anything that's got a name, depression's got a name, cancer's got a name, then that means we know the name that's stronger than all of those names. And at the name of Jesus, cancer's got to bow. At the name of Jesus, depression's got to bow. I used to work at a church. Don't, don't ever do this. Actually, I've never preached this before. This is a very Planet Fitness, no judgment zone moment. All the Pharisees, you are dismissed, okay? All the Christians who are not going to judge me, you can, you can hear this. Uh, I worked at a church, Pastor Jeremy. No one on your staff should ever do this. This is toxic. This is bad. But I'm going to confess. Uh, I, I used to do this, okay? Uh, if, like, the graphic designer was, like, taking a long time with something, I would just roll into the graphic designer's office and just say, Pastor Andy, that was the senior pastor's name. That was my boss's name. Pastor Andy wants this done right now. Or like if the admin was taking too long, I'd be like, hey, Pastor Andy wants this done in the next 45 minutes. Because I knew if I spoke that name, that it would cause people to hurry and scurry. It would cause people to like do stuff. And, and you, you want to know why Jesus says, hey, pray in my name. Speak my name over stuff. It's the equivalent of you going to depression and saying, hey, Jesus said your days in my life are numbered. You go into anxiety saying, hey, 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 no, no, no. You don't get to take up residence in me anymore. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave lives on the inside of me. You, the spirit of God in anxiety ain't coexisting in me. You got to go. I declare that there's going to be peace, not in the name of Manny or the name of Jeremy or the name of Christy or the name of Fearless. No, 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 not in the name of a denomination, but in the name of Jesus. Jesus. That's why we can sing that song all day. I speak the name of Jesus over my family. 
I speak the name of Jesus over LA. I speak the name of Jesus over my feelings or over my emotions. I speak the name of Jesus over whatever circumstance I'm going through. Come on, I speak his name because his name has power. I got a friend who said to me, you know, a couple of months ago, he was like, I, I don't believe in buying designer clothes. Doesn't make sense. I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, it, it's dumb, you know. The t-shirt costs $3, but if somebody slaps, you know, their name on it, now all of a sudden you put Gucci on it, you put Balenciaga on it, hashtag canceled, you put, <laughs> you put Rude on it, you put Reese Cooper on it, if you put a name on it, now all of a sudden the shirt that's supposed to cost $3 now costs $65, $70, $80. It doesn't make sense. And I said, really? You don't think that makes sense? And he said, no, it doesn't make sense. And I said, so you're telling me you think people out here buying cotton? No, bro. The name has more value than the material. This is why God didn't need to make you out of gold. God could dig in the dirt. And he made you out of something that doesn't have a lot of value. But then what did he do to add value? He put his name on you. The name of God is on you. You're made in his image. So when you roll up in a place, you don't come in your name. You come in the name of the one who has made you, formed you, fashioned you. I don't come in my own name. You think that a shirt's got value because of the cotton? No. The shirt's got value because of the name that's on that shirt. Raggedy shirt, $3. Put the name Rude on it, $70 shirt. Because it's the name that brings value, not the substance. I'm a sinner, but I've got God's name on me. I've got a past I'm not proud of, but I got God's name on me. Come on, when I walk around, I don't just represent my last name. My last name doesn't do a lot. My last name doesn't open doors. But I'm a Christian. I call myself by his name, and I declare that his name is a banner over me. I need a good amen in church. Um, I'm black. If you didn't notice. Uh, which means I grew up here at a black church, okay? Any black people in the room? Any black people in the room? Why y'all acting like that's how y'all actually sound? We all know. We all know. Come on. Any black people in the room? Make, there we go. The high school I went to, black people was the lowest population of the school, loudest lunch table in the cafeteria. Come on. Don't act like y'all can't make some noise, okay? Uh, I grew up pretty at a black church, okay? Which means uh, there is no ambiguity or confusion at a black church, whether or not you're doing a good job or a bad job. Sometimes I get the privilege of preaching at some vanilla churches. I grew up preaching at a chocolate church, okay? Uh, but, you know, I, I love the influence that God has given me. And sometimes I'm at, you know, vanilla churches. And uh, afterwards, you know, someone will come up to me like, Brother! <laughs> that was fantastic, you know? <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, you should have let me know while I was preaching. You was all quiet while I was preaching. Don't let me know in the lobby. Let me know in the sanctuary. Come on, talk back to me. But at a black church, at a black church, ain't no confusion about whether or not you're doing a good job or a bad job. If you're doing a bad job, everybody say bad job. If you're doing a bad job at a black church, a bad job means your jokes ain't funny. A, a bad job means like you're not treating the text well, you're not exegeting the passage well. And a church mama ain't never been to seminary, ain't never been to Bible college, but she know when she hear heresy, okay? A black church mama be like, stay in the book, son. Stay in the book. You, you, ain't, you ain't in the book. Come back to the book, okay? A bad sermon lasts way too long. Come on, don't act like you ain't never felt like, down that sermon could have ended 30 minutes ago, okay? <laughs> A bad sermon. A bad sermon's got a little bit too much condemnation, not enough conviction. Sometimes too much truth, not enough grace. Too much grace, not enough truth. You know what I'm saying? A bad sermon. If you at a black church and you are preaching bad, okay? You know, you know it's bad. Everybody know it's bad. You know it's bad because the organists don't come up. That's how you know. At a black church, you know it's bad because the organist is just like... At a black church, a church mama, a black church mama will stand up out of her seat while you preaching and say, help him, Holy Ghost. 
to which you are agreeing with the church mama. You're like, you know what, church mama? I agree with your prayer. I know this sermon needs help. Help me, Holy Ghost, okay? However, if you are at a black church and you're preaching good, oh, preaching good means people are crying and laughing at the same time. Preaching good means you are stepping on people's toes, but they want you to keep stepping on them. Preaching good, oh, if you're preaching good at a black church, that same black church mama who would have said, help him, Holy Ghost, last week will stand up and look at you like something stank, okay? A black church mama will begin to say stuff like, boy, you better preach. Say it again for the folks in the back. A black church mama will begin to say stuff like, make it plain, honey. Make it plain. A black church mama will begin to say, amen. Let's go. And here's my favorite thing that a black church mama will say. Here we go. Take your time, preacher. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. So here we go. Uh, in honor of Mother's Day, we all black church mamas today, okay? So I need everybody to respond to your boy, okay? This is not your time to sit down and be quiet. This is your time to say amen, to get up and just, just look at me like with a stank face, okay? I won't get scared. You'll make me feel like I'm at home, okay? You can say make it plain. You can say let's go. You can say preach black man. I don't care what you say. You can wave the offering envelope at me. You can just wave stuff. There we go. That's black church right there. That whole row. Y'all know. Y'all already know the deal. Just waving. Just waving Martin Luther King flag. Just, just waving stuff. Because real black church got the fans. <laughs> Come on. Uh, <laughs> Here we go. We're going to make an agreement. Okay. We're going to make an agreement. Um, <laughs> there we go. I see a flag in the back. The media team's waving a the flag. There we go. There we go. Run the slides and respond to the word. There we go. We're going to make an agreement. We're going to make an agreement. You promise to act as black as possible. I promise to act as white as possible. And we're going to end church on time. Oh, you ain't never been to a black church? Four choirs. The pastor got six sermons, okay? It just lasts all day. Black church is an event, okay? So here we go. We're going to make an agreement. You give me all your black energy. And I'm going to do this in 38 minutes. We're going to preach this whole sermon in 38 minutes. Church I grew up at, the sermon was two hours and 48 minutes, okay? We're going to do this thing. Someone's nodding like, yeah, that's why I don't go to that church no more. <laughs> Come on, let's do this. Uh, who's got a Bible? Who's got a Bible? Come on. We welcome the Orange County campus. Orange County, we love you. The online uh, campus, we love you. My name's Manny Arango. I'm super, super excited to be here today. Anyone love your pastors? Anybody love your pastors? Uh, it is an absolute honor that you would want me to preach on Mother's Day. Um, and so I don't take that lightly. Uh, this is an incredible, beautiful, diverse, growing church, and um, I don't take it lightly that you would have me, and uh, it means a whole lot to me. Your family's beautiful, and um, we've become friends recently, and I hope that we keep continuing to be friends. I think that God brings people into your life. I don't believe in circumstances or coinciden coincidences. I, I believe that uh, God has people that he wants to bring into your life. And so I think God brought you guys into our lives. And so uh, I'm super excited. Come on, anyone love faith-filled, vision-filled, principled leaders? We love you so much. We love you. Um, come on, I'm, I'm going to preach from chapter 7 of my book called Brainwashed. Um, and chapter 7 is based out of Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. If you got a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 14. And I'm going to grab it in my iPad. I'm going to preach from chapter 7. Um, I wrote this book because as, as, as someone who came from the kind of family I came from, I needed to overcome toxic thoughts to unlearn what my family of origin taught me and to learn the way that the kingdom operates. I had to unlearn what my family taught me, what culture taught me, and I had to relearn. As a young adult, probably 25 years old, I jumped into therapy, I read my Bible five times in a nine month span, and the reason that I read my Bible five, month, five times in a nine month span is because my dad took me to a crack house for the first time when I was five, uh, five years old. I was five years old, my dad took me to a crack house for the first time. And it was not the only time. My dad served an 18-year prison sentence. My mom was pregnant at the age of 12 with my older sister. 
My mom was pregnant again at 14 with my older brother. Five of my uncles are alcoholics. A couple of them have died because of alcoholism. Two of my aunts are prostitutes. Um, and, and I had to realize that everything that my family taught me was to be a victim, was to embrace poverty mentality as if it was normal, to embrace, embrace a depressive spirit as if it was normal, to embrace, embrace an anxious attitude as if it was normal. But then I became a believer. I started going to a church when I was right around 12, 13 years old, and I realized this, that it was not just the blood of my mother and my father coursing through my veins, but the moment I became a believer, Calvary's blood started running through my veins. And I was no longer cursed with any kind of generational curse. There's no curse that the enemy can put on you that the cross does not eliminate from your life. At some point, you're going to have to agree and come to the realization Oh, you're not going to like this. That when you stand before God, you cannot blame your mama. When you die and stand before your judge and your creator, you cannot blame your father. You cannot blame your auntie. You cannot blame your uncle for why you're dysfunctional. Or for why you date dumb people. Or for why you're still stuck in victim mentality. Or why you're still stuck in poverty mentality. You're not going to be able to blame anybody. When you stand before God, you're going to have to give an account for what you did with your life. So I'm the first Arango to graduate from college. I'm the first Arango with a master's degree. I'm the first Arango to have kids after marriage, not before. I'm the first Arango to own property. I'm the first Arango to have employees. I'm the first Arango to be functional. I'm the first Arango to preach the gospel. I'm the first Arango to be in ministry. I'm the first Arango to break the generational curse off of my family. Because who God has blessed, nobody can curse. Devil can't curse you if God has blessed you. I'm going to walk through every open door that God is destined for me to walk through. Because I'm more than a conqueror. I'm the head only and not the tail. I'm above only and never beneath. I need a good amen in church. You'll never walk through open doors that God has for you if you see yourself as less than who God has created you to be. Insecurity is a mindset. Poverty is a mindset. Victimhood is a mindset. And God can save your soul. You can become a Christian. But if you never allow him to rearrange your mind, you will stay stuck. Going to heaven, but never accomplishing on the earth everything that God wants you to accomplish. That's great. You can come to the altar, give your life to Jesus. Guess what, baby? We'll punch your ticket. You can go to heaven. Awesome. Congratulations. That's amazing. But there's a whole lot of life you got left to live. What good is it to give your life to Jesus who's victorious over sin and death, but you stay a victim to the abuse of your parents or to the abuse of an aunt or an uncle your whole life? God has never called you to be a victim. He's called you to be victorious. And if you're going to be victorious, you got to change your mind. you got to change your thinking. Your thinking. Your mind is the best gift God's ever given you. Woo! Best gift you have. Which means it's the biggest target for the enemy to keep locked up as his property. But I want to declare over your life today, your mind does not belong to anxiety. It belongs to God. Your mind doesn't belong to depression. It belongs to God. I want to declare over you, your mind does not belong to pornography or to lust. It belongs to God. Your mind doesn't belong to imaginations and fantasies that are lustful. It belongs to God. At some point, you're going to have to put this mind of yours on the altar and allow the Holy Ghost to wash your mind clean and to cleanse your mind. I'm saved. But unless I'm brainwashed, I'll never accomplish everything that God wants me to accomplish in the earth. God wants you to be wise. He wants you to be strategic. He wants you to be full of joy. He wants you to be full of peace. He wants you to be full of faith. And all that stuff resides in your mind. So I'm going to preach chapter 7 of brainwash today. Uh, 
I, I wrote a whole book about this because I think it is one of my life's messages to help people overcome toxic thoughts and take control of their greatest gift, which is your mind. Mark chapter 5 verse 28 says this, that the woman with the issue of blood, because she thought, ooh, because she thought, if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be free. We love to preach the fact that she touched. But before there was ever a touch, there was a thought. Because she thought, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Can I tell you, you can think your way into wealth. You can think your way into healing. You can think your way into deliverance. You can think your way into forgiveness. You can think your way into anything that God wants you to have. You can think your way into clarity. You can think your way into wisdom. You don't have, uh uh-oh, uh-oh. For most of us, you think you got a money problem. You don't have a money problem. This is why 85% of the people who win the lottery go broke within three to five years. Because they never had a money problem. They had a mind problem. You don't have a money problem. You have a management problem. You don't have a money problem. God could open up heaven and give you a million dollars right now. It would not help you if you don't get your mind free. You've got to first get your mind free. Your mind is the thing that says, I don't care about buying stuff I can't afford. I don't care what people think about me because I'm secure. It's cool because I said it's cool. Not because it's trendy. It's cool because I got confidence. And people with confidence can pull off anything. People with no confidence go spend and waste all their money on a bunch of stuff that they think makes them. A car don't make you. A house don't make you. You can take away everything I got. I'm still going to be Manny Rango because the anointing and the name of the Lord is on me. It ain't on none of the stuff I got. None of the things that God has blessed me with makes me me. That's why it's not an idol in my life. God, you can give it to me. You can take it away. You can take away anything you want to take away because the thing that makes me me is the anointing of God on my life, the purpose of God on my life, the vision that God has downloaded into my spirit. My mind's got to get free. Okay, we got to get to the sermon. This is why black church lasts so long. Come on, Matthew chapter 14. There we go. There we go. Come on. Matthew chapter 14. Come on. We're going to read it together. If there's a word that I don't say, I want you to say the word that I don't say, kind of fill in the blank style, okay? Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the? Good job. Y'all was ready. Uh, And go on ahead of him to the other? While he dismissed the crowd. Verse 23. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, He was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, no big deal, Jesus went out to them, walking on the sea. What you do when you Jesus and the boat left? You just walk on the water, you know what I'm saying? Just no big deal, just walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they praised God. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they rejoiced. Oh, my bad. They were? Ain't it crazy how you can be moments away from a miracle? And instead of rejoicing, you can actually experience fear? Ain't it crazy that God can be on the move, doing something new and unpredictable in your life, and instead of it filling you with peace, it begins to fill you with fear? Ain't it crazy how sometimes every time there's fear, we like to rebuke the devil because he's behind it. But sometimes it's God. And I don't need to rebuke the devil. I need to rebuke my flesh. Because my flesh is responding to the fact that God is doing something that's outside of the box I placed him in. How dare God do something without my permission, okay? Come on, we're just reading the Bible, we're just reading the Bible. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it, Peter replied, tell To come to on the water. Come on out, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the, he was beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, 
save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. Me and Jesus would have been fighting. <laughs> little faith? Homie, <laughs> did you just see your boy walking on water? <laughs> little faith. Which tells me that Jesus measures faith differently than the way that we measure faith. Jesus doesn't just measure how impressive something is. Jesus measures how long I'm able to sustain faith. Oh, Jesus doesn't just want momentary blips on the faith radar. Jesus wants me to be able, like the woman with the issue of blood, to have faith for 12 years, even in the middle of a circumstance that's undesirable. God doesn't just want impressive faith. Come on, sometimes we measure miracles the same way we, we measure sin. Can I teach a little bit? Did I tell you I'm getting a doctorate right now? I'm going to be the first Orango with a doctorate. You know what I'm saying? Because you can't play around with generational curses. If you're going to kill them, you're going to kill them. College wasn't enough. I was like, yeah, let me get that master's too. Master's wasn't enough. I'm like, let me get that doctorate too. Because we're not flirting with a generational curse. We're going to chop his head off. We're going to kill it. We're going to treat it like Goliath. I need a good amen in church. We look at miracles the same way that we look at sin. We have a very human perspective. And in a very human world, we rank sin. This sin is good. You know, this sin ain't that bad. This sin is really bad. This sin will send you to jail. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Whereas God, because he's perfect and holy, just sees sin as sin. All sin's the same to him. This is hard for our human mind to comprehend because some people don't think they deserve hell. And God says, nope, all sin is the same to me. Ooh, got quiet in this Presbyterian church. Okay. <laughs> Teaching you theology, okay? <laughs> for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is my arrogance that wants to look at somebody who sinned worse than me to make me feel better. God says, according to my perfect holy standard, everybody has sinned and your righteousness is his filthy rags. We do the same thing with the miraculous. So we'll praise God long, we'll praise God for a long time if he heals cancer. But can I tell you something? It takes the same amount of power for God to heal cancer as it does for him to heal a paper cut. Because he's God. He has no category for difficult, easy, medium. He's omnipotent. He has all power. So God looks at a paper cut and it takes him the same amount of power to heal cancer as it does to heal a paper cut. That should make your faith go to the next level. That I don't serve a God who's out here with limited power or limited supply. I serve a God who's so strong that the thing that freaks me out and makes me terrified, he laughs at. And so Jesus says, you have little faith because I don't see miracles the way you see them. Humans would be impressed at the fact that you walked on water. I see the fact that you got scared and you could have kept going. Come on, let's keep reading the Bible. Why did you doubt? Verse 32, and when they, and when they, into the, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. God, we ask that you would add a blessing to the reading of your word. God, we give this service to you. Help me preach this. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said together. Amen. I love the fact that this whole scenario starts out with a conversation, right? Jesus is over here. He's clearly talking to the boys in the boat. The guys are in the boat, and they don't know who it is. Some of them are like, it's a ghost. Others are like, nah, that's Jesus. And, you know, they're, they're, they're adamant. Nah, that's a ghost. I think that's a ghost. And at some point, somebody had to be like, Judas, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about, okay? And, 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 and finally, Peter gets the courage to be like, yeah, Jesus. Peter sound black to me, okay? <laughs> Jesus! Is that you? Jesus responds, Hey, Peter! It's me, bro! <laughs> Peter. We should learn how to walk on the water! <laughs> yeah! Okay. <laughs> Jesus! Calm down, bro. Calm down. Calm down. You know what I'm saying? Keep it cool. Keep it cool. <laughs> a conversation ensues where Peter says a very, very interesting thing. 
And if you've read the Bible a lot, maybe you, you're desensitized to how interesting the question is. Here's the question. And I call this a security question. Anybody ever use a website where you've got to create and answer security questions? This is an interesting security question. Jesus, if it's you, tell to come to on the water. That was a very, very interesting security question because any security question would have done the trick for Peter trying to ascertain the identity of Jesus. Here we go. Let me give you an example. Hey, Jesus, is that you? Peter, you know it's me. If it's you, what we eat for breakfast two days ago. <laughs> that would have done just fine. But actually, the security question you ask God reveals your level of maturity and your level of faith. So the security question that you hit Jesus with actually says a lot about where you are, not where he is. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Don't act like you ain't never asked God a security question. God, is that you? Yes. If it's you, bless me. If it's you, hook me up with a new job. Come on, come on, come on. Church, you're in a relationship series. Church, you're in a relationship series. Pastor Jeremy is talking about how you shouldn't date non-Christians, how you shouldn't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, you know, that's a good sermon to preach. That's a good message, you know what I'm saying? Because you know your boyfriend ain't saved. If somebody asks you, is he a Christian? You'd be like, he pray. He got his own relationship with God, you know what I'm saying? Okay, okay. Can I go on a tangent? For the, I got my own relationship with God, people? If you wanted to have a relationship with me, if you said, Pastor Manny, oh my goodness, I'm so drawn to your ministry, would love to have a relationship with you, I would love for you to disciple me, it would be so amazing to have you in my life to personally mentor me. And I would say, okay, dope, yeah, sure, you seem like a sane, safe individual, I got you. But then you added a little clause, but I don't like your wife though. I don't like your bride. I want a relationship with you, but I don't want a relationship with the woman you've married. I would say it would be evil and inappropriate for me as a husband to entertain a relationship with you unless you want to have a relationship with my bride. Because a relationship with my bride is a non-negotiable. You know how many people approach Jesus like, I want a relationship with you. Jesus says, well, I have a bride. It's called my church. If you're going to have a relationship with me, then you've got to have a relationship with the church. Now, I don't like the church. She stays and pastors be doing dumb stuff okay I never said they was perfect I said they're non-negotiable if you're going to have a relationship with Jesus that means you're going to be volunteering you're going to be attending you're going to be giving you're going to be tithing you're going to be generous you're going to be a part of the church there is no such thing as Jesus stepping out with the church to have a relationship with you how arrogant you're just so important that he has to have a relationship with you one-on-one and you can't be a part of the church. Shut up. Get to church on Sunday. Get here early. Bring a notebook. Get a Bible. Invest yourself into the community of the church. Because it's not just a negotiable. It is not a non-profit 501c3. It's not just the building we meet at. No, it's the bride of Christ. Jesus calls it his bride. Why? So that you would understand how much of a non-negotiable it actually is. But I got my own relationship with God. Okay. Back to the security question. You know your boyfriend ain't saved. So Pastor Jeremy says, break up with your boyfriend because you know he ain't saved. And you start saying stuff like he got his own relationship with God, which ain't nowhere to be found in the Bible. But what is biblical is don't be yoked together with unbelievers. That is definitely in the Bible. So you start doing a little security question with God. God, when Pastor Jeremy was preaching about breaking up with my boyfriend, was that you? God goes, yes. <laughs> and it's James Earl Jones' voice. Yeah. Yes, that was me. Well, if it's you, have him break up with me first. Because I don't have the guts to break up with him. Come on, don't act like that ain't never been your security question. I want us to examine Peter's security question. Jesus, if it's 
you tell me to get out of my boat and come to you on the water? You know how radical of a security question this is? That Peter would say, if it's actually you, then that means I'm the one that's got to jump through some hoops. It's not me putting you on the, on the stand to cross-examine you. It's you putting me on the stand to cross-examine me. God, if it's you, then I know you're not going to let me stay in my comfort zone. If it's you, you're not going to let me stay in this boat. If it's you, then I've got to move. If it's you, I've got to do something that makes me uncomfortable. If it's you, I've got to change my mind. If it's you, I've got to renew my mind. If it's you, then now I don't just read my Bible, but I let my Bible read me. Oh, come on. Don't act like you've never read, met these people who they just read the Bible. I mean, I'm reading this, and I just don't know if could a whale really swallow Jonah. It doesn't make sense because I'm reading the Bible because I'm in control. Because I've got the Bible on the witness stand, and I'm cross-examining it because I'm omniscient because I know everything. And can a virgin really get pregnant. I don't know. This virgin Mary thing doesn't make a lot of sense. And this doesn't make sense. And this doesn't make sense. And I want to poke holes in all the arguments. Guess what? An immature Christian will read the Bible. A mature Christian lets the Bible read them. I'm not here to put the Bible on the stand. I'm here to say, when I open up this book, read my fear. When I open up this book, read my doubt. When I open up this book, read my secret sin and cause it to be exposed. When I read this book, I hand it. I put it over me as the authority of my life. I don't examine it like I'm the authority over it. I declare the word of God is sufficient. The word of God is more authoritative than anything that I could ever read. I'm not reading it, scrutinizing it. I'm letting it scrutinize me. When the word says if you look at a woman lustfully, You've already committed adultery. I'm letting that read me and causing there to be conviction in my heart for how I objectify women. I'm letting the word read me as opposed to reading the word. Peter is displaying maturity and faith. I say, hey, if that's you, I know that if it's you, then I'm up for a challenge. If it's you, then I've got to choose faith over fear. If it's you, then I'm not just leaving a boat, I'm leaving 11 people for whom the boat is comfortable for them. But I've outgrown the very thing that is comfortable for 11 other people. If that's actually you, I'm leaving some relationships behind. If it's you, I'm leaving some friendships behind. If it's you, I'm leaving some habits and some addictions behind. Not if it's you, bless me. <laughs> if it's you, let me be such a good disciple that I leave everything to follow after you. And get this. <laughs> Peter then proceeds to get out of a boat that ain't broke. Has God ever called you to get out of a boat that is not broken at all? For some of us, God is like, hey, get out that boat with that dude. That relationship is, a, is toxic. And you're like, but the boat ain't broke. And then two years go by, and now he's cheated on you. He got a whole other baby mama. He got, you got receipts to prove it. And now that the boat is broken, now you want to get out the boat. It don't take a lot of faith to get out of a boat that's already broke. You know what takes faith? To get out of a boat before it ever breaks. The Holy Ghost will cause you to get out of stuff that other people would stay in. Holy Ghost asked me to quit my job. I should have got an amen right there. Just said quit my job. You don't even need to hear the rest. Just The Holy Ghost told me to quit my job. My direct deposit job. Whew. Direct deposit is anointed. It's like I'm just out here living life and I just wake up one day and there's money there. You know what I'm saying? Direct deposit. Wow. wow. <laughs> December 2019, God asked me to quit my job. 
And you know, January 2020 was dope. You know, I was a self-employed individual. I, God asked me to quit the job that I had at a local church to start doing this, traveling the world and preaching the gospel. So January of 2020, oh, a lot of churches booked me to speak. The, they were generous, and guess what? I paid my mortgage. I'm the first Orango to own property, so paying my mortgage, big deal. February, did a lot of traveling. Churches were generous, did conferences, events. It was dope. Paid my mortgage. First half of March. Traveled, did a lot of speaking engagements. Church was generous. Uh, but then Tom Hanks got COVID. <laughs> and I'm out here, I've left my boat, called my direct deposit, and I'm just out here on the water. Like, now Holy Ghost, you couldn't have given me a heads up that like the world was gonna shut down? You couldn't have like told me, keep your job for like another year. You couldn't have like whispered that in my ear real quick. But you know sometimes, when we step out of the boat, we want to guarantee that it's all going to work out. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I don't have a guarantee for you. Here's the only guarantee. That when the worst thing you could have ever imagined happens, when your worst case scenario actually happens, the moment you say, Lord, save me, I'll be right there to grab you up out of the water. Here's the only guarantee you got. There's no guarantee you won't sink. The only guarantee is that you won't drown. I've got a guarantee for you. The guarantee is that it may go bad, but I'm here with you. The guarantee is that though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. Why? Because I'm with you. Because my presence is with you. Here's the only only guarantee you got is that you'll never be by yourself. You left 11 relationships for one relationship. And as long as you got me, you got everything you need. And I'll never let you drown. But you may sink. You may get wet. You may quit your job, start walking on some water, and a pandemic may just hit. And you may just have to Figure it out, but I got you. And I can tell you, as God is my judge, I had more peace in the middle of a pandemic with no job, and I had no, uh, uh, no guaranteed way of how I was going to make a living, had more peace out here in the middle of the lake, standing on water, than I had in the boat, because the boat is not safe, it's just familiar. The boat is not safe, it's just all you know. And at some point, you're going to have to get out of the boat, and you're going to have to let the water become your new familiar. You're going to have to let faith be familiar for you. The boat's not safe. It's, it's just predictable. And for some of us, we've bought into the illusion of predictable and familiar. It's why you won't break up with that dude who you know is toxic. I don't know why the Holy Ghost keeps bringing me right back there. That ain't my ADHD. That's the Holy Ghost. You won't leave that dude... Not because he's safe, he ain't safe. He's hit you, he ain't safe, he's cheated on you. He's not safe, he's just familiar. You can't leave familiar for unfamiliar. And I'm here to tell you, you're safer out here on the water with no predictability and no familiarity. As long as Jesus is out here, you're better out here not knowing how anything's gonna work out, just relying on him. Worst case scenario happens, Peter sinks. You may ask, is this a Mother's Day message? And I would say, yep, here we go. Let's land the plane. Me and my wife, he, she was here in the first service. She, she uh, needed to go back to the hotel. And uh, me and my wife, we battled with infertility for five years. For five years, we prayed that we would get pregnant. But we didn't get pregnant. For five years, we prayed that we would be Mom and dad one day, and it felt like everybody around us was getting pregnant and we weren't. And I remember Mother's Day was Mother's Day and Father's Day were the two days at church that we avoided like the plague. If we, if we even came to church, we sat in the back, because come on, everybody knows church. Everybody named mama want to come up to you. 
When y'all going to get pregnant? When you going to have kids? You know what I'm saying? We've been married for two weeks. Please leave us alone, you know? And I remember finally getting out of the boat. We're in the middle of a pandemic. I didn't have a direct deposit, didn't have a job, didn't have speaking engagements, couldn't travel because of the pandemic. And God told us in the middle of a pandemic to spend $25,000 to do a procedure called IVF, in vitro fertilization. Anybody familiar with IVF? Wave at me, nod at me, something, come on. We emptied our savings account to do IVF. And guess what? For the first time in five years, it felt like we were walking on water. Every single time we would go to an appointment before this five-year period, it was always a negative report. You'll never get pregnant. You'll never have kids. You should just adopt. You should, the doctors were just so full of fear, so full of doubt. We finally spent the $25,000. We started doing IVF. And all of a sudden, it felt like we were walking on water. It was like good report after good report. And it finally looked like there was going to be daybreak after a long, 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 long night. And I had the best day and the worst day of my life at the same time. Best day of my life. I'll never forget it. I came home from Phoenix, Arizona. I'd been preaching. I landed, came home from the airport. My wife had balloons. She had positive pregnancy tests. And I remember the look on her face. She was like, she was just recording me. I was wondering why I walked in the house and she was just recording. And I walked into the kitchen and I saw the balloons and I saw the pregnancy test. I freaked out. So much joy. She was finally going to be a mom. I was finally going to be a dad. I was so excited, I ran outside and told our neighbors. <laughs> told the male lady, I'm going to be a dad. My wife's going to be a mom. Super excited. Oh. Walking on water can quickly become sinking. And the sweet taste of a miracle turned bitter as we went in for our first ultrasound. My wife's finally going to be a mom. I hooked up the machines and I saw the nurse's face go pale. And she began to say the words, there's no heartbeat. And I was so angry at God. How dare God bless us with a miracle. Why would God let me walk on water? Only for me to sink to the bottom of the lake. You know, sometimes when you experience miscarriage, not just a literal miscarriage, but the metaphorical miscarriage, the enemy wants to get in your mind and tell you that a miracle didn't happen. But I refuse to let the enemy tell me that we didn't experience a miracle of pregnancy. Even though it didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen, guess what? I've got to hold in tension the fact that there's a miscarriage and a miracle here. We're going through the process to remove the fetal tissue. And now the doctors are going from using human terms to very medical terms. And I sunk into depression. We're in the middle of COVID. I ain't got a job. I ain't got no money. I don't know how we're going to pay the mortgage. We emptied our savings account. I'm depressed. I'm isolated. I'm at the house by myself. I, I'm overwhelmed. Oh, I wonder, is there anybody in the room who knows what it feels like to be at the bottom of the lake? Oh, you've walked on water. You've experienced a miracle. And you know, it's almost like the high of the high. The low of the low. I said these words in the middle of that whole journey. I said to my wife, who was way more saved than me. I said to my wife, I'm, I'm mad that God would even let us get pregnant. I repent for those words now. But can I be honest about what I was feeling? Come on, Planet Fitness, baby. No judgment zone. I said, it would have been better to never get pregnant than to have experienced a miracle and now have to deal with a miscarriage. Here's what my wife said. I wish she was in this service. I didn't say this last service. Here's what my wife said. I'm just grateful for the 12 weeks I got to be a pregnant woman. I never even got pregnant before. Yes, this miscarriage hurts. But I'm grateful that I felt morning sickness for the first time and I never felt that before. I'm grateful for what I got and gratitude turns what you got into 
you enough. At some point, you got to stop feeling bad for yourself and start changing your mind. You got to change your mind. It doesn't mean we deny the humanity of the experience. I was depressed. I was anxious. I was scared. I'm looking at the numbers in our savings account dwindle. That stuff's real. We don't deny our humanity. We just say, God, you're the Lord over all of this humanness that's happening right now. My wife says these words. I'll never forget it. She says, let's try IVF again. Remember, she's more saved than me. Come, come on. Exactly. Woman of God. He said, let's try IVF again. I said, you got $25,000 laying around somewhere that I don't know about? And then I said, I will never make myself that vulnerable to that much pain ever again in my life. You want to know something? There's some of us, we're right here. You're with Jesus, but you're guarded. Your defenses are up. You've been playing it safe. Your faith has been on cruise control. I want to show you this verse. Uh, it's, it's verse 32. Go, give, me, give me verse 32. The media team's been crushing it all day long. I've been throwing curveballs. And when they... And when they... Into the... Wait a second. Wait a second. Jesus is over there. They're in the boat. Peter gets out of the boat and he walks towards. We know that he makes it to because as soon as he sinks, Jesus what? How did he get back to the boat? I've heard a lot of sermons on the first time Peter walked on the water. I want to preach to you about the second time Peter walked on the water. Oh, because it's easy to get out of a boat when you don't know what the worst case scenario could be. It's a whole other thing to get up out of the water and to say, oh, we're about to do this again. This is about to be my victory lap. I'm getting back to that boat. I'm not going to stay here. Depression is not going to keep me here. Fear is not going to keep me here. Doubt is not going to keep me here. I'm getting back to the boat. My wife said, I think we should do IVF again. I said, if you think I'm getting back on this water, you out of your mind. A random check for $4,000 arrived to our house. Another check for $1,500 arrived at our house. Our pastors now, Pastor Robert and Taylor Madhu, randomly sent us $2,000. They had no idea that we had a miscarriage, no idea that my wife, not even me, wanted to do an IVF again. Before you know, we had another $25,000. And I'm here to tell you today, is there a picture of my family? Is there a picture of my family? My son, my biological son, my son is almost two years old because I didn't stay here. I opened myself up to be hurt again. I opened myself up to be disappointed again. And I took one step after another and got back to the boat. I want to preach to somebody's faith today. You have more faith in you than you thought you had. And your latter will be greater than your former. Your best days are not behind you. Your best days are ahead of you. The bottom of the lake will make you think that it's never going to get better. That you're just going to drown forever. I was depressed. I was anxious. I was traumatized. After the miscarriage, my wife kept having recurring dreams that she dropped the baby down the stairs. I mean, we were traumatized. But can I tell you something? God is stronger than your trauma. He's stronger than doubt and fear and depression and anxiety. I didn't write this book because I thought it was a good topic. I wrote this book out of my pain. I wrote this book out of the trauma of my own life. And I want you to get this message in your head that it is your mind that's gonna put one foot in front of the other and choose faith when the 
world wants you to choose doubt, to choose to believe again and hope again and dream again and let faith arise in you again. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost today. Here's the key word. Here's the key word. Again. Again. I know you've had faith. I want you to have faith. I know that you've taken some risks. I want you to risk. Come on, I, I, I get it. You used, to, you used to give your all to church. And then you got church hurt. Guess what? God needs you to trust again. Because real faith doesn't just walk on the water once. Because there's a difference between walking to Jesus and walking with Jesus. Oh, I get it. I get it. He's asking you to do something that's uncomfortable. But he said, no, 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 I got you. I got you. We're going to do this thing together. We're going to get back to the boat. But they're going to make fun of me. You never got out of the boat to prove them wrong. So we're not going to walk back to the boat to prove them right. You don't got to worry about no haters. Stop that narrative. Change your mind. Focus, I got you. We're gonna walk together. We're gonna do this thing together. You're a victorious, overcoming disciple of Jesus. Hallelujah. If I had stayed here, if I had stayed here, I wouldn't have a son right now scared to get hurt again scared to open myself up to being traumatized again I didn't say this in the first service you know we got pregnant again with my son that ultrasound for my son we went to the same hospital same nurse same exam room me and my wife both, I mean, we start like PTSD. We're triggered. We recognize the room. We recognize the nurse. It was the same clinic. And I remember saying to the Holy Spirit, why, come on, of all the exam rooms in this clinic, and the Holy Spirit said, I needed to bring you back to this room because this is where you buried all your faith and this is where you buried all your hope and we need to dig it back up again the most painful thing Jesus can ask is what he says to Mary and Martha where did you bury Lazarus? because I didn't tell you to bury him you should have waited till I got here and you buried all of your hopes and buried all of your dreams and the most painful thing for God to do is come rip the scab open and tell you to unearth all of the stuff that you For a lot of you, you're avoiding a call with your mother because there's some maternal pain, you've buried it and you've stuffed it and you've tried to sweep it under a rug. You can't sweep anything under the rug. One of the things that the Holy Spirit does when he comes into your life is he begins to say, hey, all this stuff that you've tried to forget, all the pain you've tried to stuff, let's pull that out and let's deal with it. Ooh. As long as you hide it, God can't heal it. As long as you think that as, as you hide it, It'll deal with itself. It'll go away. You'll find yourself battling with the same addiction your mom's battled with. You'll realize that generational strongholds have a way of attaching themselves to you through unforgiveness, through bitterness and resentment. And maybe this Mother's Day is a Mother's Day where you start to deal with some pain. Who am I preaching to in the room? Just wave at me. Who am I preaching to in the room? I want to pray for two groups of people. We can stand up all over the room. I'm going to pray. We're going to worship.
and you're going to get back to the boat. Oh, come on, I'm prophesying over your life. You're going to walk back to the boat. You're going to walk back to the boat. Your best days are not ahead of you. You're going to walk back to the boat. You got to walk back to the boat. Come on. I know you thought that this was the journey. In the middle of all of the drama, I remember my wife saying, God's brought us too far to just keep us here. You're only halfway there. I know this feels like the end, but it's only the halfway point of your journey. There's more faith left in you. You got to make a round trip. God's not done with you yet. Two groups I want to pray for. Before I pray for you, I want to tell you about a great way. I, I believe in the message of this book. I believe that if you got toxic thoughts, I think if you spend the next 30 days reading through this book, I believe with everything in me that a stronghold, a mental stronghold will break off of your life. I want to tell you how to get this book for free. Everybody like free stuff. I want to tell you how to get this book as a free gift. During that pandemic, when I couldn't travel, couldn't get on any airplanes, couldn't go anywhere, the Holy Spirit always tells us stuff we don't want to hear. The Holy Spirit says, stop complaining about what you don't have. What do you have? And I said, well, I got a degree from a college in biblical and theological studies. I I'm working on my doctorate. I got a garage and I got one camera. And the Holy Spirit said, then start creating courses for people. Seminary level courses. Take the stuff that you're learning in your doctorate and teach it to the people at your church. And we started out with one course, the book of John. I taught it chapter by chapter. A bunch of people subscribed to the platform and it started working just like Hulu and Netflix. And the Holy Spirit said, keep on going. So I did a course on Matthew. And I said, since I got John and Matthew, I may as well do Mark. Did Mark. The Holy Spirit said, you didn't done Matthew. Mark and John, go ahead, do Luke. Did Luke. And then I figured, man, we may as well go to the Old Testament. I may as well do a course on Exodus. I may as well do Genesis. So we started a rhythm of producing one full 90-minute to two-hour course every single month. And providing it to people for $13 a month. Right now, today, remember I was freaking out during that pandemic? How am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to pay my bills? Right now, 2,000 people across the globe all pay us $13 every single month. Like a subscription service to teach them the Bible. I was at a church last week and a dude came up to me and said, I canceled my Netflix subscription and I got an Arma subscription. Why would I sow into the enemy's entertainment when I could sow into the kingdom mentality that I want in my life? Arm is a subscription-based streaming platform created to help people understand the Bible for themselves. There's a QR code that you can grab. That QR code will help you to subscribe. I would love to teach you the Bible. More than anything else, preaching is fun. But I would love to teach you the Bible. Because if you don't know the Bible, there's no amount of sermons in the world that can actually feed you. You don't just need to eat on Sundays. The Bible says that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You need to eat Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You got to eat. I would love to personally teach you the Bible. Right now we have over 40 courses on the platform. Our courses are about 90 minutes to two hours, but each session is 12 minutes. I want to challenge you. Spend 12 minutes with me every day for the next month. I promise you that you will become biblically literate in the next month. Who sold? You're like, yep, I'm in. Go ahead, scan that QR code. Scan that QR code. If you come to the table with my books and show us the confirmation that you've signed up, we will hand you a free book and I will sign your book. Is there a picture of the five-year-old boy a mom, a mom came up to me at an event just like this, said, I'm subscribing to Arma. I said, that's the best decision you can make as a parent. I said, make sure that as you watch the platform every day, make sure that your kids can see you. She listened to what I said and she started watching it with her five-year-old son. 
After three months, guess what her son said? I want it on my iPad. Her five-year-old son watches all of our courses. And guess what? We'll never have to repair that boy because we've prepared him and armed him to understand the word of God and the will of God for his life. No brainer. 13 bucks a month and you can become biblically literate. I would love to teach you the Bible. You can scan that QR code or you can DM me on Instagram the word Arma. You get signed up on your phone or you can come to the back and I will sign you up on my iPad personally. I love y'all. Let me pray. First group, anybody believe in God for children? Come on, anybody believe in God for kids? Come on, get down here. Get down here. I want to lay my hands on you. You're believing God for children. We declare right now in the name of Jesus, the Bible says that the barren woman is going to rejoice. So we declare sons and daughters born to your house. We declare right now, whatever is confusing the doctors, we ask right now that Holy Ghost that you would fix it in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you right now for sons and daughters. God, we thank you that the, what God has started in you, he's going to complete that it's not going to end with you. God, we thank you right now. What doctors are saying is impossible. It's impossible only with men, but it's possible with God. So we lay hands. God, your word says that we should lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. We curse infertility in the name of Jesus. And we declare that sons and daughters will be born to your house. We prophesy sons and daughters will be born to your house. He's going to fill your house. Your quiver is full. We prophesy your quiver. It's full. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says this, none among you will miscarry. That he'll bless your food and your water. That you're going to multiply and increase in number. We declare war on the enemy and we declare right now that whatever spirit of infertility is, is around, we say that the doctors are going to be confused when you get pregnant. The sons and daughters are going to be born to your home. For some, Mother's Day is a hard day because they're battling with infertility. For some, Mother's Day is a hard day because you have a broken relationship with your mom. Who's that for? Wave at me. Broken relationship with your mom. You need healing. Get down here. Come on. You don't need physical healing. You need emotional healing. Get down here. Get down here. Come on. There's some stuff that you got to let go. There's some stuff that you got to let go. Come on, we declare forgiveness. We declare peace over your life. We declare peace over your life. God, I thank you for grace. Surrender. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I don't know who needs to hear this. I hope it's the Holy Ghost. Look at me. You're battling with unforgiveness. You're battling with bitterness. Listen to me. I had to get here with my dad. My dad took me to a crack house at five, okay? I had to get to this place. He did the best he could with what he had. I can't hold someone accountable to be the parent that they're not able to be. Just because they're my parent does not make them perfect. And it is idolatry to have godlike expectations for a human being. It is idolatry to have godlike expectations for a human. People fail. I get it. Maybe your parent failed in some way. Guess what? God's never failed. He's never let you down. You got to operate in forgiveness. You got to be the bigger person. Come on, God, we thank you right now for grace to forgive. God, we thank you right now for emotional healing. God, I don't know what memory keeps coming to mind that the enemy wants to use to keep you stuck, but we declare right now you're free. Whatever cycle you've been in, we declare you're free. Whatever mountain you've been circling around, wandering in the wilderness, we declare you're free. You're going to break out of that cycle right now in the name of Jesus. We declare no generational curse can attach itself to you. We declare that you're blessed from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. We declare that you're anointed, that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. We take dominion authority over every lie of the enemy. We uproot every lie that the enemy has ever said to you. And we declare right now by the power of the Holy Ghost that freedom will reign and rule in your life. We declare freedom over your life. We declare freedom over your life. You're going to let her go. You got to let her go. You got to let it go. Let all the pain go. Let the bitterness go. Let the resentment go. You got to accept.
accept her for who she is. You got to begin to forgive. God, we thank you right now for our grace to let go, for our grace to forgive. As you set them free, you're going to get free. As you set people free, we declare that you're going to get free. Unprecedented freedom over your life. Unprecedented freedom over your life. Freedom over your life. Freedom over your life. Freedom over your life. We declare divine freedom over your life. We stand in the gap for you. We intercede. And we declare that unforgiveness is not going to have your heart. Your heart belongs to God. We thank you for a soft heart in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you that you restore. You restore the years that the locusts have eaten in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, hands lifted all over the room. God, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for reconciliation. God, we thank you for miracles. We thank you for signs and wonders. God, you're going to cause barren people to rejoice. God, we thank you for positive doctor's reports. God, we thank you by faith in the name of Jesus that we're going to get back to the boat. God, we thank you that we didn't just hear a word today to entertain us, but we got an impartation of faith today. God, we claim it as ours. God, we worship you. We worship you in the room. Fearless Online Church, man, what an amazing day so far. Right now is an opportunity for us to give back. We've been receiving so much. I, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed from what's going on in this stream and what God is doing in this church. Proverbs 19:17 says this, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deeds. This church is all about reaching the needs of our city and cities worldwide. In fact, last year alone, we were able to pass out 2.2 million pounds of food. Come on, somebody, that's a lot of food. We, we gave out food and we were able to pray for every single person. We also washed their cars, pretty much the modern day uh, version of washing someone's feet. Man, what an awesome experience that we've got to have through generous givers just like you. You may not be able to be here on ground zero level, feeding people, clothing people, loving on people, but you sure can be a part of this by giving your finances and lending in a sense to the Lord. And we know that you can't outgive God. I've found over 41 years of life that no matter how much I give to the Lord, He always gives back. He gives back so much more no matter how much I release. I really believe that the spirit of generosity is alive in our generation. We need to meet people's physical needs so they'll open their hearts so God can meet their spiritual needs. Would you help us do that? We want to give out more clothing. We want to give out more food. We want to touch thousands more people. In fact, this year, I'm believing to give out four million pounds of food. Would you step out in faith with us? Would you become a partner today? Everything in life to get anywhere really takes partnership. Every one of us are here because of partnership. Life happens because of partnership. I have a dream that we would reach people's physical need to give them a spiritual truth. Who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in their life. That love that we so boldly profess as Christians. Would you pray today about your gift, whatever size, large or small, that you're gonna partner with us once a month to see God do something incredible in a city. You can sign up for Fearless Partners today. Why wait another day? Let's be generous like our God and watch that generous God while we bless others continue to fill our, our vats, our barns, our, our dream, our business, our family fuller than we ever could have ourselves. God bless you as you give today. Let me pray over your giving as I believe people are moved today to become generous and partner with the Fearless Partners. Jesus, we pray over this giving. We pray over these people that are going to sow into this ministry. We, we say right now, God, Lord, as we lend to the poor, as we help those in need, Lord, that you would help those that are giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with us today. We hope that you enjoyed today's message. We hope that it blessed you and we hope you have an incredible rest of your day. God bless.